engages with a fairly wide audience. So let's take two parts of what you just said. One, one, and I'll say them so we remember them. One is um, the issue of we're not ready at 22 to stop learning. And the other is the, um, the more general issue of um, the unhappy choice between cloistered academia, if you can get it, mm -hmm. yeah. and dealing with the pitiless market and, uh, and adjusting your genius accordingly, uh, and, there, and therefore, um, f in the most cases, ruining it, because what, you wind up going to Hollywood to write screenplays or something like that. Sure. Sorry, I didn't mean to <laughs> say anything about <laughs> the dreams of many. There's some great screenplays out there. But, um, so take, let's take the first. I, I feel very, I've read, I've read a whole lot of books about the crisis of higher education. I've been thinking about this. Anybody who reads my blog knows that a third of the time I'm writing about um, academia and so forth. I've thought about this. And we really aren't ready. The students that I work with are not ready. You know, Hillary Reinsberg is not ready, really, to stop learning. She wants to, but, but I'm not recommending grad school because it's, why am I not recommending grad school? Because there are no academic jobs out of it, and you're basically doing it for the love of it. And if you can get a fellowship, that's fine. You'll live like a pauper mostly, but at least you'll basically pay the bills. And then you're then what? Uh, so there's something fundamentally wrong if we could do what maybe Robert, Robert Maynard Hutchins, wa Hutchins wanted us to do, which is to start the college level work after the sophomore year of high school. Maybe people would be sated by 22, and they could go out and be normal people. Yeah. Yeah, something Do you that. have some thoughts about the misshapenness of the, I mean, what do they do? Okay, I'm just transforming it into recommendations. Oh, From wow. your point of view, what do you say to all these mostly young writers who are not ready at 22 to give it up and have heard all the lectures about not going to grad school? Mm. What do you say? Mm. Um, consulting a wisdom I do not possess channeling the spirit of, um, I, I would say, um, I mean, I, I'll give you just the most mamby-pamby half answer, um, and it wasn't what you were searching for. This I means mean, something really good is coming. I, I, <laughs> I've been listening to the podcast. I know exactly no, I what wish, he's, I, I know your game, man. I wish it, I wish what it, I'm about to say is really stupid, and then you say, oh. No, 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 this is not, this is, believe me, this is nothing, but, uh, um, uh, I, had, I basically had two graduate school experiences, and they were totally different from one another. They were total an antipodes. The one was um, UVA has a, has a terminal master's. They over-admit people. Yes. Um, uh, it, I don't know if they do this still, but uh, you know, a, a lot of people go through it who- The process is called permission to proceed. Yeah, and then you hit permission to proceed. I, ha I, I was yeah. there and I went through it. Permission to proceed to the PhD. And um, And- uh, at the time, I was an incredible snob about it. I thought, oh, no, 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 people should be here. They're, they have long-term theoretical and scholarly commitments. They're pursuing a career in this, blah, blah, blah. I, mean, I was insufferable, clearly. But, um, but, uh, but the advantage of it, the enorm adva enormous advantage of it, looking back on a program structured that way, is a lot of people are there who are not going to go on and become professors. They're not professorial by temperament. They're curious and uh, literate, and they want to use that literacy in various ways in the world, uh, that's terrific. It oxygenates a program like that, and they need it uh, badly. And then the second reason, uh, this, the second reason, doing something like a terminal MA in English might be good is pick a department carefully. And at the at, when I was at UVA, the philosopher Richard Rorty was there, as, as Al referred to. Uh, he was at that moment in his career where he had won a MacArthur Genius Grant. He had written what for a philosopher has to be considered a kind of general interest bestseller. The New York Times was published, was uh, uh, profiling him in the Sunday Magazine. He'd become an intellectual celebrity, and he was free to pursue his own interests. And someone like that can be enormously, enormously inspiring. I mean, you know, here's a guy who routinely writes about Heidegger and Kant. He reads in German. He's just terrifically, terrifically smart. But the scope of his intellectual commitments to both politics uh, to the legacy of American pragmatism, to uh, the you know to the development of literary criticism within the academy, to uh, Proust. I mean, he just cared about so many different things, uh, and he showed you that you could compare that you could care about that range of things without a sacrifice to depth, um, and furthermore, cared very much about writing in a in a completely uh, lucid style. Right. I mean, to the point he almost writes a little bit like Forrest Gump. There's a kind of Gumpian quality wow. to some of his writing. Yeah, you know, okay, maybe. Uh, I, well, anyway. but um, uh, And then there's another guy. Mark, do you know Mark Edmondson? Absolutely. Right. So Mark, I mean, Mark is, it was, was hugely moved by Brilliant the presence person. of Rorty at, at right. UVA and influenced changed by Changed his it, career. Changed his career. Really 
seriously considered about uh, considered the possibility of writing for a general audience. He just wrote that piece about. Um, it just is in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. It's yeah, one of the best yeah, things he's yeah. ever written. Yeah, I know written. the one you're I'll talking about. I'll find a link to, but it was sort of about the demand that discourse stay at a certain level right. and not rise. There, there's no aspirational discourse anymore now. Right. If you, um, uh, but but the, to encounter people like that when you're young, who the, the skeptics on the faculty, you know, who say, yeah, it worked for me, and that was a different time, but you know, here's something I can teach you, and 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 then you move on. I. I mean, getting a doctorate is a whole other, I think, uh, kettle of fish. You have to, you have to have. A, I know, I know people for whom it worked. It's, it's funny. I, I'd be very curious to hear what you think about this. That, that it's a, it's a totally irrational market, the job market, right? Unless it isn't. That there are just some people who really are brilliant at it. They're born to do it, and they almost come out like ex utero. Their first minute ex utero. They're like ready to become, you know, be a Duke But the, the problem professor. with saying that is that everyone in this room is thinking that it might be him or her. No, because it's not a com because it's not a compliment. So they shouldn't think I'm wonderful, <laughs> therefore I'm that person. That's the it's problem. Like, there is no translation of wonderful yeah. into tenure track positions. Look, it, you know what I actually think it's this I actually do think this is here comes here comes the tiny little dram of oh, wisdom. Stop I with finally the found Just it. Tell us it's good. I know I, I I finally found it. Just sit down Take a deep breath and ask yourself who your hero is. I really, that's so corny, okay. but it's so true. And right. if your hero is Janet Malcolm, don't fucking go to graduate school. Don't go to grad school. And if your hero, if your hero uh -oh, is uh, Mark Edmondson. Oh, yeah, you know, but he's such an exception. But, but so is Janet Malcolm. Do you yeah, understand? but I'm saying I mean, you, you, you created a false dichotomy between a person who succeeded out doing brilliant general writing and reporting and researching um, and who has, has a readership. And on the, one, on the other hand, this si someone sitting at the edge of academia who's trying to do that within academia. Can you give us a square, more traditional, you don't have to name a name, but that, the conversation would go better if you could give us someone who's much squarer academically in but, the university. But, 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 if you're, but you're naming a hero now. You know, I mean, so no square heroes allowed. In, uh, no, okay, so now we're talking at the New Yorker or in the Harvard no, in, English in, Department? In the Harvard English Department. <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, well, Luke Manan, Helen, Helen, uh, Helen Vendler. Okay, no. there we go. Okay, it's out on the floor. Helen Vendler is the alternative now. Okay. If you ha if your hero is Helen Vendler, <laughs> this got pugilistic very fast. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, 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 I'm trying to. I want us to see whether the hero can be squarely in academia, and and, oh. and it works. For and you. even she's not a great example then. I mean, because she has a general audience thing too. Once in a while. Yeah, I mean, let's think of someone more square. Nominations are open. But for I mean, I know people. Per, I mean, you know, I know people personally who are in academia who are now in their yeah. early to mid career. Of course, uh, and you don't know them, you know, because you wouldn't. They're not. They're not. I mean, you might know them as a specialist, but you wouldn't right. know them otherwise. Right. You know, but they're but they're not your your hero is someone that came to you through the right. the grapevine broadly construed, right? right? And and but I think that's a good way to do it, only because. Look, your chances of becoming Janet, my chances of becoming Janet Malcolm are, are, are minuscule, and your chances of being Richard Rorty are minuscule, and the world adapts and, change and changes, right. and, and the social conditions under which Helen Vendler becomes so, Helen Vendler have long since, uh, you know, inhered. And so, but, but it's still useful for structuring your own ambitions. I mean, they ought to be, that's the way they ought to be structured. They shouldn't be structured fearfully. And uh, and that was my biggest mistake. I hugged the shore, right? The great phrase from right. John Updike. That's and I right. really hugged the shore. You did. And trust me, you wake up at 40, be like, what the fuck am I doing? I'm still on the shore. Right. What the fuck? I mean, it's right. much better to say Janet Malcolm is an, and she is, in my estimation, just a transcendent hero in the world of nonfiction writing with intellectual you know, aspirations. And it's much better to say at the age of 22, OK, because what's your worst case scenario? You know, you're still in your 20s, and you stumbled a little bit, and then you do something else. But right. I, I would do it at, totally aspirationally. That's your great luxury. Now I'm now 